Good afternoon, folks. This is Cece with the Institute for Service Excellence. We have a huge group of folks joining us as we speak and expected to continue joining us uh, through our presentation today. Um, ISE is really proud to be hosting uh, the Modern Cleaning third Thursday at 3.30 webinar. Uh, Tom and Janice of Modern Cleaning have uh, uh, promised to help us kind of tackle that uh, that pesky vacuum question, which one works best and why and what do I need to look at and what questions do I need to ask and uh, what am I looking for, uh, for for answers of those questions of, uh, about our vacuums. And uh, uh, we have a special, really proud to be able to um, uh, you know, help them uh, to give away a Pro Team Sierra backpack. It is a value of $950, and we will be announcing the winner at the end of the presentation. Um, I'll be running a, a random uh, randomization, a random picker from uh, everybody who is uh, who's on our call, and somebody will hear their name at the end of the presentation. So, uh, pretty pretty excited to be uh, performing that duty for Modern Cleaning this afternoon. Um, Tom, Janice, do we have you guys with us yet? Yes, I'm here. And hey, I'm Janice. here. Hey, yeah. Tom, how are you guys doing today? We're fine. How are you? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> oh, Janice is laughing already. I, I, I'm, I, I'm predicting some, some good uh, comedy with these two again. Uh, lots of, lots of folks tune in just to hear, uh, hear how they joke together, and it's really fun uh, to have this pair with us. Well, I have uh, four. Uh, sorry, three thirty on the dot. How about you guys? Are we ready to get started? Yes. Absolutely. Well, thank you for uh, joining us this afternoon. This is uh, we've had a lot of fun pulling this together. Uh, I've done a lot of testing. I've uh, identified more things that we want to play with, but we're going to share some information that uh, we believe will be useful to you. And uh, we're excited to give away a vacuum here at the end. So we'll get started. If you'd like to ask a question, if you have a comment to make, please use the chat tool. And if it's a really good comment or question, um, Cece might even break in and ask it in the middle. Otherwise, we do save all um, questions for the end. And here's our contact information. You're welcome to contact us at Modern Cleaning at any time through any of these avenues. And um, those of us who, those of you who've um, been on our webinars before know that, you know, you've heard this before, but we did, modern cleaning kind of evolved from our own field testing and researching with our own business through Castle Keepers. And we do re try hard to provide the most up-to-date, eco-friendly cleaning technologies and practical tips and support to our customers and other cleaning professionals. And our philosophy and the goals of modern cleaning are to protect the health of building occupants and our cleaning technicians and to choose environmentally preferable cleaning products and equipment and to improve the appearance of indoor space and protect our clients' investments. And today we're going to talk about how vacuums work in case anyone's ever wondered that choosing a vacuum, um, key productivity considerations, which include methodology, soil pickup and soil retention and removal, the life cycle costing of vacuums, and we're going to then give away our Pro, a Protein Sierra backpack vacuum. Um, here's a, this is the most fun I had putting this webinar together. Well, that's not just, true, but... <laughs> it's just, Yes, it was putting together this and thinking up little captions for the two cartoons. <laughs> so I think I'm I'm done. Evolution <laughs> evolution of vacuums. Any questions? <laughs> Just kidding. And um, we'll start with vacuuming 101. Um, vacuuming. A lot of this. These four bullet points are all. It's a summarization of the research we've been looking at all week. Um, Proper vacuuming is the most effective way to keep your carpet clean. And uh, I think it's pretty much an industry standard that people understand that carpet 
is a sink for allergens and other particles. It traps them and reduces their circulation in the air. And regular vacuuming with an appropriate vacuum has a large positive impact on the air everyone breathes when there's carpet in the environment. And vacuums that effectively remove and contain soil help carpets last longer and keep them looking good. So you don't have to replace them as often and you don't get sick from having a dirty carpet in your home or in your office. So I know a lot of people have ripped carpet out of their home and have replaced it with hardwood flooring, think it improves the indoor air quality. So is this telling us something different? Yes, a um, lot of research back from early 2000s shows that um, from lots of different countries in the world show that once you pull out your carpet, the there's no place for the dust to go and it just keeps circulating around in the air. So if you have carpet and it's vacuumed regularly and you keep it clean, the indoor air quality is actually better. Yes, it's better than with hardwood floors. Uh, that's an important thing for our customers to know, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we're um, going to talk now about choosing your vacuum. And you're telling me that little toy vacuum is actually something that they make that works. Yes, that's, I found that picture on a gadget website. Looks like a pencil sharpener. <laughs> no, it's a desk vacuum. Okay. Um, uh, performance of your vacuum really depends upon four main things. Um, I put amperage or amps last because all amps really tell you is how much electricity your vacuum is going to use. <clears throat> it's really not any indication of performance, <clears throat> but it is often mentioned as part of performance. So I just wanted to get that straight. This is the last time we're going to talk about amperage. What you really need to concentrate on in learning about for your vacuum is airflow or how, how much air a vacuum can move through the, through the machine. And that is often measured in cubic feet per minute or CFM. Lift is also an, another term and these work together how well a vacuum pulls up dirt, or suction is another word, but it's a, you will often see it on product literature as static lift or possibly water lift or inches of lift. And the problem here is that there are no standards for vacuums and that's why you'll see it listed so many different ways. Filtration is also a very, very important part of vacuum performance because it minimizes particles that escape back out of the vacuum. And just because a vacuum really looks cool doesn't mean the design is most effective for helping the other three things, airflow, air lift, and filtration work to um, the best advantage. So when you see somebody selling a vacuum cleaner and talking about amperage as a uh, part of the value proposition, maybe we should be suspect. Yes. Yes. If that's the only information you get about your vacuum, then... Um. You need to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. Maybe something's not quite right there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> These are some features of vacuums that I was just trolling around on the Healthy Facilities Institute website which um, I really like. And they were mentioning some important vacuum features that people mention that they look at when they are purchasing vacuums, and this is the list. Um, filtration, purchase price, durability, weight, warranty, performance, ease of maintenance, noise level, supplies cost, attachments, and comfort or ergonomics. And we'll touch on a lot of these today. Looking cool is not on there, is it? <clears throat> no. <laughs> oh, okay. Or amperage. No, amperage. Or no. RPMs. RPMs aren't on there either. <laughs> yes, uh, how many times the uh, brush spins per minute. So your function of your vacuum, um, retail vacuums, the kind you get at Walmart or Sam's, they are really designed to function several hours a week for the average homeowner who only vacuums once or twice a week and possibly for at the most an hour to an hour and a half 
each time. Commercial vacuums, however, are designed to function several hours a day, seven days a week. And as a purchaser of vacuums for a residential cleaning company, you need to understand that if you use your retail vacuum, if you purchase a retail vacuum and you use it for commercial use, you can void your warranty. Um, we'll, we'll go into a little bit of how vacuums work now. Um, this is a single motor upright. It's called the dirty air design because the fan comes before the vacuum filter and it pull it put actually pushes the soil and the dust into the filter. And the fan does does have direct contact with the soil so it does get dirty. It does increase the maintenance on this type of machine. And um it generally comes with a rotating brush that is um has a a yeah, the, band around it or a, a belt. A belt. You have a belt that drives the, uh, the the roller brush. So the motor in this runs both the brush and the fan. Yeah. Typically, this uh, type of vacuum is sold at a lower price point in part because it's only it only has one motor. Um, it's typically a little bit lighter, but as uh, Jim <coughs> mentioned, one of the uh, uh, potential pitfalls is because it's uh, pushing dust as opposed to pulling the dust. It's like pushing a string. It doesn't always go where you want it to go when you're pushing it, and sometimes it winds up coming out places of the vacuum and getting back into the air. Um, this is a photo of a, uh, a single motor uh, upright vacuum, and this is the back of the vacuum where the uh, soil leaves uh, this tube in the back and actually goes in the dust bag. And you can see where dust is accumulating here in the back of the vacuum. And what you will find um, is, if you're, you're, you're able to measure this, is uh, a lot of the soil that you're sucking out of the carpet, you're just blowing it back up in the air. So when you're cleaning the home, you're having to dust more than you would otherwise. So it's uh, is actually uh, creating more work for you than, than what it would if it was capturing all the dust. So what's the alternative if you're looking at an upright? This is a dual motor. It has a motor that drives the brush and then it has a second motor that sucks the air past the brush <clears throat> and up into the filter. So it doesn't actually, the fan blades don't actually come in contact with the dust it just drops into the filter bag. Um, the, it's generally the, it's heavier because of the second motor than a single motor upright. A little more expensive because mm -hmm. uh, there's more moving parts uh, uh, in the second motor. The upside is if you're into upright vacuums is that uh, you're, you're pulling the uh, soil into the uh, the dust bag, and it's uh, easier to contain. And if uh, just because it's a, a dual motor upright doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's uh, as efficient, as, you know, it's extremely efficient in containing dust. But your odds are better. It's uh, at least you, you've got an opportunity to design a vacuum that will contain most of the dust that you're picking up out of the carpet. Right, and you might have two filters in a vacuum like this. You have your filter bag, and then Maybe a filter in another area. I've seen them in two or three different places. Sometimes they're around or near the exhaust port. And sometimes they call them HEPA filters. Right. <laughs> we'll talk about those here in a minute. This is a canister vac. Um, the advantage of canister vacs is they can run at higher rotations per minute, which can create stronger airflow and lift um, or suction at the head of the hose. It usually le needs less maintenance, again, because the fan is behind the vacuum filter bag. Do you have anything to add? No, it's, uh, in, in some regards, the, uh, the way that it removes soil is similar to a dual uh, motor upright from the standpoint that you will have a motor here in the power head and a second motor here in the, in, in the canister creating the suction. So uh, 
it has different design qualities, and then from a, from a productivity standpoint, there, there are different uh, performance considerations, but the actual way that it moves soil is similar to a uh, dual motor upright. So let's talk about HEPA filters. Um, HEPA stands for high efficient, well, when I went to school, it stood for high efficient particulate arrestance, but uh, I've just seen it referred to as high efficiency, high efficiency particulate air now by uh, trolling the internet. Um, HEPA are, that filters are actually manufactured to a standard, tested to a standard, um, and they have to meet certain performance standards too. They are designed to remove 99.97% of particles that are 0.3 microns and greater. Um, that is the standard. You and, had to go geeky on the word, didn't you? <laughs> Excuse me, yes. And just to give you an idea um, of size, a, the diameter of a person's hair is about 50 microns, 70 microns. So that goes pretty small. And anything under one micron is considered by the EPA to be long, damage your lungs. It has potential to damage your lung as, lungs if it's breathed in. But um, the main thing about HEPA filters is they don't work unless they're part of a HEPA system. HEPA system usually means a sealed unit, a tightly sealed unit. And um, also another part of the HEPA system is the there is always a filter behind the motor too to catch anything, the particles that come off the motor. Um, it must have ga gaskets to prevent air from bypassing the motor and it must be measured and verified by a laser particle counter um, to exacting ISO standards. So um, because of all this, they're usually pretty expensive vacuums, and you usually only really see them in clean rooms. So are, are you telling us that there are a whole lot of vacuums out there that use the word HEPA filter, but just because it has a HEPA filter doesn't necessarily mean it's capturing as much dust as they would want you to believe? Yes. Yes, dear. Thank you. So this is one of our little sanitaires that we use um, in our own business, but uh, on the left, you see um, this is our sanitaire without a HEPA filter. and. Um, this is the HEPA filter they provide on the right. On the right, where, and where, where, where on, on the right? end? Over, oh, there it is. <laughs> over ne um, behind the motor, but it's just kind of snapped on the back, and this is definitely not a sealed unit. You can see from how dirty the vacuum was. I, I was kind of horrified to see how dirty it was, but um, when we pulled it out to take pictures of it, but. Um, and it is, uh, it's just slapped on the back. That is not a sealed unit. That is just an expensive yeah. filter slapped on the back of a little port yeah. portavac. And it doesn't mean that that HEPA filter isn't capturing some dust. It does, but it doesn't certainly qualify as a uh, HEPA system. You're right. not uh, containing as much dust <laughs> as, as maybe you'd want to want to think or hope. Mm -hmm. So we went to um, one of the groups that does um, certify vacuums is called the Carpet and Rug Institute. It's carpet-rug.org, is it? We're going to be <laughs> distributing a list of references and websites and all kinds of great information at the end of this. So if you signed up, we have your email address. You'll get all that at the end. But the Carpet and Rug Institute works with an independent laboratory to certify not only vacuums, but all kind of carpet-related products like hot water, extraction machines, and commercial cleaning chemicals, things like that. Um, they have a CRI seal of approval green label vacuum program that certifies for both residential and commercial use, household rather, household and commercial use. The goal of this um, certification is to improve indoor air quality and proper carpet maintenance. The way they test the um, vacuums is to, uh, based on soil removal, where they use x-ray fluor fluorescence analyzers, which were developed by NASA, from what I understand. Wow. <laughs> they, 
<laughs> they test dust containment of the vacuum itself, and their standards are it has to contain um, 35 to 100 micrograms per cubic meter um, of the dust that it pulls in. And they also test how well it does on the, um, in protecting the carpet itself, surface appearance change. Um, and so if it tears up your carpet, but if it removes soil and it contains dust but it tears up your carpet, it's not doing any good. So they test that too. Not a desirable outcome. And they do have three levels of performance and they tell you whether it's a bronze level, a silver level, or a gold level. And um, performing vacuum. And of course, gold is the best. And if you'd like to learn more about this, you can go on their website. And they have all of the vacuums they've tested and what, where they fit into so, their. So what you're telling me is if it's gold, it holds more dust and picks up more soil than if it's silver or bronze. Right, because they test both um, the size of the particles it captures and the amount of the particles it can't capture. So this, it's very, very good vacuum, the gold standard vacuum. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the whole process of selecting a vacuum cleaner and, and some of the criteria we use and some of the um, financial considerations. Um, Whenever we're selecting a piece of equipment, and I think most people uh, think the same way, the uh, initial purchase price is something that, that we take a hard look at. And uh, here's an example of, of two vacuum cleaners and spent a little time shopping around earlier in the week. And um, best price we found on the vacuum cleaner on the right, if you're an Arxy member, is for $531.44. That's and the left. Left, I'm sorry. Well, it could have been the right if I was dyslexic. Forgive me, but uh, this one over here on the left, it's a can, it's a, a backpack vacuum, and it's uh, on on sale for, if you're an RC member for five thirty one. On the right is an upright that uh, retails for somewhere in the ballpark of two fifty three hundred dollars. But if you shop around, you can find it uh, for for less than two hundred. So, on the surface, all things being equal. Um, you're certainly uh, spending less money up front if you buy the uh, vacuum for less than 200. But initial purchase price, uh, you know, as with a lot of things, including vacuum cleaners, certainly shouldn't be the only consideration when buying something. There's a long list of criteria that we spoke to early, and that's only one of them. Um, from a cost standpoint, something else you need to think about is the ongoing uh, supply cost and what's the total cost of ownership of, of a vacuum cleaner. Um, again, shopping around for that same uh, backpack vacuum that we looked at earlier, uh, you can uh, buy dust bags. Again, if you're an Arxy member, get a, a really attractive discount at uh, $8.65 a pack, and there's 10 bags in a pack, so basically you're getting uh, $0.87 cents a bag uh, for the, uh, the bags that go in the backpack. On the right, Shopped around, went to a lot of websites, and this was the best price I was able to find for bags that that went into the upright, and it was a dollar and equated to a dollar and seven cents per bag. So the bag uh, was on the upright here cost a little bit more than the bag on the left, but if you remember, the the vacuum on the right initial purchase cost was less. So the question is, which is the better value, just based on cost? Well, what we did here was do an example of uh, one perspective as to how we can look at that. Uh, we're comparing the backpack here on the left to the upright on the right. We've got the initial purchase price. If you look at the warranties associated with each one of these, um, the warranties go into a lot of detail, and there's uh, it's more complicated than just saying a three-year warranty on the backpack versus a one-year warranty on the upright. But in essence, if you want to boil it down to something simple, you, you could, could certainly uh, make that statement. And for illustrative purposes, we're going to do that. So with a warranty three times as long, it would stand to figure that uh, the expectation is it would last three times as long. So. What we do is take the initial purchase price of the vacuum, in this case, divide it by three. The initial purchase price of the upright 
divide it by one. So you're getting an annualized purchase price of 177 on the backpack versus 189 on the upright. So on an annual basis, you're doing a little bit better on the backpack. But the purchase price, again, is only just part of this. Let's get some other uh, considerations that actually uh, have a larger bearing on your uh, the, the cost of ownership. You want to make the assumption that uh, you're using this in the team environment and you're cleaning an average of three homes per day, five uh, days per week, 52 weeks in a year, then that would come out to be 780 homes a year that you would be cleaning with either one of these vacuums. Cost of the dust bag is uh, 87 cents here, a dollar uh, seven cents here. Multiply that times the number of cleanings. And this again is making the assumption that you would be replacing the bag after each home. Uh, some of us do that, some of us don't. That's a matter of preference and basically what expectations you set with your clients. Um, if you're cleaning in a part of the country where bed bugs are a concern or just you know a situation where your clients are aware and just want to make sure that you aren't bringing soil from previous homes into their home, that's not a bad practice. And for the cost per bag, that really isn't that big a deal. But if you look at over the course of the year, you could be spending $678 here for bags versus $834 for bags. In either case, that's a lot more on bags than what the cost of the vacuum is. So there's a couple of points here. One, you know, if you're looking at the, the ownership cost, don't get just hung up on the initial purchase price. You need to be looking at what the bags are going to cost. And two, you really need to be thinking about, you know, how frequently you change the bags and where you set those expectations because you can spend a lot of money in bags over, over the course of a year. So you add both of them together, you can see the ownership mm -hmm. cost in this case with the, uh, with the backpack is less than it is with the upright. Now we're not talking about productivity and how long it takes to clean a home. We're going to be doing that here in a minute. You're going to see that that's even more relevant in this exercise, but when you're looking at costs and, and, and trying to maximize the profit that you're making off of your cleaning business when, when uh, selecting vacuums and using vacuums, this is an important part of the uh, evaluation as well. So let's go back to productivity. Um, we're going to be talking both about using a canister vac Oh, all three, canister vac, upright, and a backpack vacuum. Um, the most common, of all vacuum manufacturers in their warranty and owner's manual recommend that you use slow, repetitive front-to-back motions in overlapping sequence when you vacuum. And um, that is especially if you use a power head. Um, and of course, slow, repetitive is that up for debate whether that happens in a home, but um, when you use your forward and backward stroke, it, you can get under, it's best used to get under obstructive, obstructed low or tight areas around chairs, tables, and under beds, things like that. Um, there's something called an outline stroke, which is used to vacuum edges and corners of room where you go around the room first before you start vacuuming and you just do an outline. This has a greatest efficiency, especially when you vacuum in one direction, down a wall of a room or a hallway. There's, this, um, there's a third stroke that is called the side-to-side -side stroke, and apparently we have that up there twice, but um, <laughs> somehow. A third and fourth <laughs> stroke. But um, the side-to-side -side stroke, you cannot use the power head with this. This is the commercial technique, a commercial vacuuming technique where you use on carpet, you would use a head without a brush, just a, a smooth head, um, and on hard surface floors, you'd use a brush, and you just go from side to side, you, you twist at the waist and you go from side to side, and that's a very efficient, very fast way to vacuum, but you can't do it with the power head. Um, another way to increase productivity is to replace the bags when half full so that you get the best filtration possible out of your vacuum. 
Um, keep the vacuum head in full contact with the floor, and um, also vacuuming frequently. frequency has a lot to do with how productive you can be, too. Because if you're just going in once a month, you're going to have a lot more work to do vacuuming than a weekly customer. Can we talk about the productivity part of this? Because in previous uh, discussions, for those of you who are, are regulars to our webinars, we talk a lot about you know, the primary cost in our business when we're talking about being profitable, the big cost by far, over 70% of our cost is payroll and payroll-related expenses. So uh, we're going to be showing here shortly that, you know, even with considering the cost of the vacuum cleaner and the, uh, the dust bags and all the other components, uh, your biggest opportunity for, for savings and more profit is with improved productivity. So, um, oh. oh, there he is. <laughs> Look what Cece showed is me. Is that the do. side to side? Yeah, uh, that, side yeah. There. Yes, I hope you guys side caught side. that. <laughs> Can you make it do it again? I don't think so. Anyway, um, soil containment. Um, basically, when you're vacuuming, are you cleaning or are you polluting the air? Um, dust is made up of Skin flakes, hair, dirt, soil, lint, bacteria, viruses, fungi, dust mite species, insect body parts, and toxic chemical and mineral residues, etc. And um, some of the research that I've cited in our at the end say that up to 40% of what the vacuum sucks in is actually spewed out the back in the exhaust especially of the older model vacuums. Um, a good vacuum cleaner is means, if you have a good vacuum cleaner, you have decreased dusting tasks over time because your vacuum is keeping the particles and the dust inside the vacuum. It's not putting it back out there to settle back on your, um, on your furniture. And this is healthier for the cleaning technicians and the clients. So let me get this straight, that up to 40% of dust mites and feces and all that funky stuff that was buried down in the carpet, I'm sucking it up and I might be blowing it up in the air and breathing. Yes, and a lot of this research is coming out of hospitals and um, places where the air movement and studying air movement is important in terms of reducing the chance of other patients getting MARSA and VRE and other of other bacterial and viral infections that are really getting hard to. Um, a shot of penicillin doesn't make it go away. Right. So that's where this research is coming from. You know, from a productivity standpoint, it's 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 not too difficult to take a vacuum and with a stopwatch and test one against another, but a, a, a part that's not as obvious is how much extra dusting are you having to do if you're using a vacuum that's not containing all of the dust that it's picking up. That's particularly true in a home that you clean on a weekly weight basis mm -hmm. or every other week basis, that uh, in time, if you've got a really good vacuum, you're making your dusting job easier, and again, that's another opportunity to reduce that labor cost, which is the biggest part of of your cost of cleaning a home. So um, we've talked in the past, uh, one of our past um, webinars about vacuum productivity. The ISSA 447 um, Actually, they got tabs. 500 and some yeah. of them now. They found a few tabs. Okay. Found some new ones. Okay. So um, this is the time it takes to clean a thousand square feet of carpet with a 12 inch orifice on your vacuum. Um, or carpet tool on your vacuum. For an upright vacuum, it takes 26.8 minutes. For a canister vacuum, 24 minutes. And a backpack vacuum, eight and a quarter minutes. And this is in um, more office settings where you have larger areas to clean. And it's also using that side-to-side um, -side motion with your backpack vacuum and your canister vacuum. So we use this. We did a, uh, a webinar a few months ago where we were talking about productivity and used vacuums as an illustrative point. And we used the ISSA standards, and we looked at those numbers and thought that, holy cow, what a big difference between the backpack and the other types of vacuums. And 
we were scratching our heads trying to figure out if that uh, those numbers from a commercial office space would really apply to, to house cleaning. So being the nerds that we are, we figured we'd go out and we'd give it a try. So what we did was we found a uh, uh, an apartment, a small apartment. We uh, were actually we were vacuuming uh, somewhere around 450 uh, square feet of space here yeah, in total. Yeah, we found an, an, an elderly woman with a bad back to um, do the vacuuming for us. An elderly woman with a bad back. <laughs> well. So, um, where's your first one? Let's go ahead and uh, watch. Uh, this. this uh, no, uprights first. Uprights first. Okay, mm -hmm. let's watch and see what we got here. There's a clock down on the right that you can see that we do a little uh, time lapse. And she's elderly and she's got a bad back, but she moves pretty quick. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> This again was about 500 square feet of carpeted area, and um, that was an Oryx backpack, Oryx vacuum, one of our old Oryx. And um, what struck me the most about vacuuming with that was how many times they had to plug and unplug in just a 500 square foot apartment. Actually, it's closer to 400. 400. But, you know, who's who's you know splitting hairs here? It's um. Took almost 10 minutes to, to do that. Mm -hmm. It's um it's a 35 foot cord. The vacuum weighs around nine pounds. It was uh, just watching the video. I noticed how loud the vacuum was. But so. um, there's a there's a lot of movement, and when you're when you're vacuuming, actually moving soil, you're being productive. But when you're stopping, plugging, unplugging, moving around and positioning the vacuum, that's slowing you down. And those are the work elements that you want to reduce or eliminate. So. And this is the, the next one's the canister vac, the protein canister vac. Let's try that. You notice it's very quiet. You do. I felt like I, in this um, small apartment, I felt like I was kind of struggling with both the cord and the um, canister, moving it around. But um, it's very light to carry, so that it wasn't a problem moving it. Um, it took a little less time than with the upright. But uh, there are a lot of, uh, I guess, additional work elements involved manipulating the canister itself. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, it is very quiet. It's 66 decibels. I've vacuumed homes where kids were playing, you know, practicing the piano while I was vacuuming and um, didn't seem to interfere. <laughs> now, one of the things that we aren't uh, really demonstrating here, this will be topics for, for you know, future future discussions, future webinars, is the actual uh, ability to pick up soil in one pass versus two or three passes. The actual uh, air movement and, and, and lift of uh, that particular canister there is about as high as what you're going to find for any vacuum. Uh, available for residential use. Uh, depending upon the soil that you're dealing with, I know that we use that vacuum here in Charleston when we're, we're uh, cleaning vacation rentals on a beach, and we find it to uh, be very helpful for picking sand up yes, off very. of floors, that you can pick mm -hmm. it up in one pass, where a vacuum that doesn't uh, have the same uh, level of performance, you may have to pass over that same sand several times to get it off of the floor. Yeah, we love this vacuum for pet hair and for sand. It has a high airflow and a and very good lift. So we had to try this one more time with a backpack. Let's uh, see what happens here. So 
So, so that was just under nine minutes. Um, it was just basically all I was moving was the power nozzle and the wand, which is about eight pounds. So that's just about the same as um, weight as the auric. Um, again, it, um, the airflow and the lift weren't available for the auric, but they're uh, very good for the backpack based on the, what are they called, the stats for the vacuum. It's, um, it doesn't have a real, it's not really loud at 68 decibels, and I think the U.S. Green Building um, group that does the LEED standards recommends you stay under 70 decibels, so both the proteins stay under those of that particular level, noise level. So um, I really liked using the backpack vacuum, and um, it's, we constantly have to remind our um, cleaning technicians to put it on correctly so it doesn't, when they bend over or kneel or squat to pick up their, move things around and pick up the core that it does, they don't feel like it's going over their shoulder, like it's going to pitch over their shoulder or may, that it's not real snug around their waist. We have to constantly reinforce to wear it correctly so that they're most, the most productive with it. But it is, everyone agrees, all of our clean technicians agree, you can get a lot done with your backpack vacuum on. Um, not as much in a residential setting as in a commercial setting, but it's still, you can be very productive with it. And there, there's a savings to be, be realized that is material. Um, going back to a, a slide that we used uh, several months ago using those, same uh, synthetic uh, standard times that uh, ISSA publishes. Um, look at your standard size home and do the math according to uh, their numbers. You'd save about 20 minutes per home, and if you do the math of uh, that equates to like a you know a third of an hour. Say you're paying your tax ten dollars an hour. Uh, Mark at uh, that would be three dollars and thirty three cents of just raw labor. You'd have to throw in your workers comp and in uh, taxes and things like that, bump it up another 25%, that takes you to 416 times uh, three homes a day, $12 and change, five days a week, $62 a week, times 52 uh, weeks in a year, that would be $3,200 and in, in change. The uh, 20 minutes though, based on the video that we shot and also taking into consideration the additional benefit of uh, how many passes you would have to take to pick up soil and, and the uh, dust removal component. Um, we figured that a more reasonable number would be somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes. So we adjusted that number and took uh, the more conservative uh, estimate of 10 minutes savings per home. It would still equate to over $1,600 a year in labor savings. So if you uh, pay, you, you compare that to the Delta and price or the overall ownership cost of, say, the, the vacuum cleaners that we were evaluating earlier, again, the bigger, the biggest issue is the uh, performance from a pure method standpoint as well as capturing the soil and, uh, you know, how many passes you have to, to make the, to pick up the soil and actually keeping the dust inside of the vacuum rather than letting it back in the home. Um, how many homes you do over the course of the year and what you pay your people and, you know, is this 10 minutes, is this 15 minutes, even if it's five minutes, you're saving yourself, you know, over $800 a year, which is more than the price of any of the vacuum cleaners that you'd be looking at. So anyway, you slice it. It's, it's, it's purely a matter of, of the labor component. I'd like to point out, too, that just because there are carpet tracks in a carpet doesn't mean the carpet's any cleaner. Um, and I think it's a challenge that we have in residential cleaning to kind of educate our clients that we we can do a good job vacuuming, vacuuming without a power nozzle or a power head that with a roller brush that actually beats the supposedly beats the soil out of the carpet. 
you if your carpet has enough airflow and lift, you don't need that. And um, if we could, I think our numbers would have been even better with the backpack if we had used some of the uh, back and forth strokes with the vacuum that they do in commercial. Yeah, and, and that's a that's a that's a good point. That if you're vacuuming a lot of hard space, the uh, particular power head that you look there has the ability you can turn that off, so the power head isn't running, and you can use that on on hard floors. But if you have a large hard floor area, we find that we can be more productive by just putting a a standard uh, bristled floor piece on the uh, on the vacuum, and you can move more quickly. So said another way, if you're using uh, that backpack or the canister, either one in, in these examples, if you're cleaning a you know three by five foot uh, entrance way into a home, it might make more sense just to leave the power head on and turn the uh, brush off and do it. But if you're cleaning several hundred feet of uh, hard floor, we can be more productive by just putting a bristle brush on it. And if you were doing that, if we were cleaning hard floor as opposed to carpet, the difference in performance would, would, would be much greater. And I, I venture to say it would be greater if we could convince clients that they don't need carpet tracks, too, and just use the... Um, they want to see the groom carpet. Yeah, they, they really... They don't think you're vacuumed if they don't see the carpet tracks. <laughs> Although I talk to people in other parts of the country who have success uh, without grooming the carpet, and they, too, admit that uh, they can be very you know, more productive without having to, to do that. So part of that, I guess, is the expectation you're able to establish with your customers. So we've kind of shifted around our vacuum features a bit uh, from the original list, and I'll let you go ahead and take Sure. That um, out of all the criteria that we, we talked about uh, earlier for, for selecting a vacuum, if you're looking at selecting a vacuum that's going to uh, help you be more efficient and basically uh, reduce the cost of, of what it costs to, to clean a home and to be more profitable, um, we would suggest that performance would, would be given a high consideration. The ones on the left and uh, the red uh, performance, certainly look at durability. Um, even if you're spending more on a vacuum, if it's got a longer warranty and then based on, you know, just industry experience and, and talking to people who use the vacuum, if you know it lasts a long time, you need to be thinking about the full life cycle costing rather than just the investment cost. Supply cost is important. You really want to look at that. We illustrated that, uh, you know, whatever bargain you think you might be getting on, on the front end, you might be giving it back several times over on the back end on the supply cost. And probably one of the ones that's least obvious is the filtration component. You could be creating a lot more work for yourself over the long run if your vacuum isn't uh, holding on to uh, as much dust as, as possible. You want to talk to your resources here? Is it really gone up to 540 cleaning time? Yeah, they just okay. like, you know, discovering new planets and yeah, like elements <laughs> and whatnot. They, there's more stuff to be cleaned, I guess. Okay, so um, we found, I've always been fascinated by the cleaning time calculator. Um, we There's a lot of good information on the Carpet and Rug Institute website, and we Oh, we missed an wrong. A there. The, the ARPIT? The ARPIT? <laughs> that was my fault. We and will be getting you a, uh, an e you'll be getting an email here shortly after this that will have these references with the C and ARPIT. And the Healthy Facilities Institute also had some really, really good stuff that helped us put this together. Um, my favorite website of all for cleaning is the Cleaning Industry Research Institute. I always check that no matter what first, no matter what I'm looking for. And um, Pro Team has one of the best websites for um, vacuums I've ever seen. It's uh, You can find everything from your warranty information to your um, owner's manual to a bunch of uh, ways to vacuum more efficiently and for health and 
They do it all. And third-party studies that third explain party in a lot studies, of yes. detail mm -hmm. uh, what some of the topics that we touched upon. A lot there. of good, good training videos for these vacuums on that website. And these are the more um, really? egghead type studies that we referred to. Okay, we'll just kind of... See that fourth one, older, cheaper vacuum cleaners re release more bacteria and dust. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess I guess uh, you, it's on the internet, so we. It must know. be true. Okay, we are uh, expecting to get uh, quite a few questions here, so we've got uh, a little bit of time. Uh, see, see if you want to open it up, we can can talk about this a little bit. Um, that's great. I've got a few questions that have come in um, as you've been talking. Um, you were talking just a few minutes ago about the you know calculating the savings, and. Um, well, one a clarification, is that savings before or after expenses? Savings would be defined as the what your cost would be comparing two alternatives. You're going to have a cost involved with vacuuming a home and cleaning a home regardless. So savings would be the difference between doing it uh, with a vacuum that doesn't pick soil up very well and uh, spews out a lot of dust versus what it would cost if you have a vacuum that does a better job of picking up soil and allows you to clean the home more quickly. So it's the difference between alternatives. Okay, very good. Um, a, a second question from uh, Sarah. Um, when you're looking just at the filter, not at the HEPA filtration system, but just the filter itself in the vacuum, is a HEPA rated filter better than a non-HEPA rated filter? I think that would be contingent upon the design of the overall yeah. vacuum. For mm -hmm. example, there are a lot of good vacuum cleaners out there. I mean, uh, some of the protein equipment that, that we use every day for general uh, residential cleaning, we do not use uh, HEPA-rated vacuum cleaner. It's not a HEPA system, and there's no real HEPA filter on it. But that being said, it's a four-level filtration system that does an excellent job of capturing dust. It does a better job of that than other vacuums that will have a HEPA filter you know, slapped on the side of it, but spewing dust out of other places. So the, yeah, the protein again, their independent research shows that they the level for a true HEPA filter is 0.3 microns per cubic meter, and the our protein vacuums get one micron per cubic meter, so it's very close. It, it isn't so much about the HEPA. microscopic level. Yeah, it isn't so and much. There, it's not a HEPA vacuum. But it isn't so much about the HEPA filter. If, if they say it has a HEPA filter, but it's not truly uh, a HEPA system, then in a lot of cases you're better off not even being fooled by the whole HEPA thing, yeah, but looking at the design of the overall vacuum. Yeah, I'm not. I don't know if it'd be worth the money to just have to kind of factor that in. All right. We have we have lots of questions coming in, so we're going to try to move through these uh, nice and quickly. Um, Victor asks, is it correct to say that you recommend the backpack for homes? How about what is the most efficient vacuum for carpeted stairs? The my my personal experience is the backpack is the most efficient for stairs. You know, think, let's think about that for a minute. That's a, that's an excellent question. Yeah. What, are, what are the alternatives? There's three basic types of vacuums. You've got an upright, you've got a canister, and you've got a backpack. The upright is, is a bit cumbersome because you're having to pick it up and move it. It's not meant to be carried around in your hand. You're having to pick it up and go from step to step, and you can only really do the horizontal surface with that. Um, with the, uh, with the canister, you've got this whole canister thing that you're having to deal with, and you can pick it around and lift it from step to step, but that's cumbersome. And uh, that would be like number 541 elements, I guess, on the ISSA <laughs> standard. You have that backpack on your back, you can zip up and down the steps. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, I, I think that's a slam dunk. Uh, 
And really, I guess that might be a topic for a future webinar as well in terms of uh, getting up the stopwatch and shooting some video. But I'm, I think it's very safe to say that the backpack would be the most efficient way to do stairs. All righty. Uh, Rick asks about the coach, the protein coach, in comparison with the Sierra. Which one is better for residential? Coach is a commercial product. Um, from a performance standpoint, in terms of air movement and water lift, it's an excellent uh, design. Uh, the hose and the watt system is a little bit different. It's a one and a half inch as opposed to one and a quarter. So you're going to find that your typical residential attachments don't, right now out of the box anyway, interface with it. Um, you can't put the uh, Wessel power head on it. Right. There's no no electrical uh, you know connection for for a power head. Uh, so if, if, if you need the power head. So, so yeah, if 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 if, if you're you're making a, a purchase and are trying to decide what's the best uh, protein backpack to get for residential cleaning, that you know it is the Sierra. Um, it's also it ha doesn't have as round a profile. It's more oval, so you can get. No. The, the the Sierra is more oval. Right. The coach is round, sticks out a little bit more, which right. can create some, you know, it's a greater chance of bumping into something with that. And related to that, Kathy asks, is there any data from Pro Team or from our uh, uh, work with Modern Cleaning here, any data on accidents and bumping with the backpacks? Yeah get accidents and bumping with all vacuums. Yes. It's just a matter of, you know, picking picking your poison, so to speak. Um, there is a learning curve. You have to become aware that you've got this thing on your back. But the canister, for instance, you have issues with pulling the canister into uh, door jams and... Furniture legs and... Um, uh, around, yeah, around corners. And, and and with the uh with the upright the uh, maneuverability isn't as good and you're 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 pushing around more weight and you can bump into things with that yeah. too in a different way, but nevertheless it's uh you know, there's not a vacuum made that doesn't have its specific set of risks. And yeah. a lot of it's really just training and becoming used to, to, to having you know, using the piece of equipment. That that's right, 'cause um you can it's the back and forth motion with the, an upright and the any type of power head. You can knock things off with your elbow and with the handle with the, just the back and forth motion. Okay. Uh, these questions are rolling in so fast I can barely keep up. Uh, okay, we've got uh, uh, Ruth um, says that her uh, cleaners comment that um, the that their backs hurt a little bit, and she's relating this perhaps to changing the bag. Uh, or, or you know the the filter and the bag in the in the backpack getting too full. What is your recommendation regarding uh, how frequently, either during the day or during the week, to change the bag? We prefer changing the bag after every home, and it's just a, it's a it's a it's a value proposition to our clients. It gives them a higher level of comfort that you aren't uh, bringing soil in from one home into another home, especially. You know, when people are concerned about uh, things like bed bugs and, uh, you know, cross-contamination. Uh, that being said, as far as the back hurting, that's you, a training issue. Yeah, you really, really need to go back to how they're putting it on and how they're wearing it because um, I, I found it to be very comfortable even though I I. But that you know, how, you know how to wear it. One of the things yeah. that you'll be getting after this webinar, there'll be a, a, a link to a, a video that you'll be getting. It's a, it's a, a video that's made by Protein that does an excellent job of demonstrating the proper way to fit and to, to put the backpack on. There are several straps that need to be adjusted. When it's adjusted properly, you're wearing it kind of like the, the way you would a, a camping backpack. Camping backpack. And that's where basically most of the research was done on how heavy um, – what the weight of a backpack should be, well, that's comfortable to carry, where on the back you should carry it, which should be a little higher on the back, and also that the weight should be on the waist, around on the hip bones. It should be on the hips. 
And um, if, like, if you're more triangular shaped, like I am, you really have to make sure that you it's fitted comfortably across the uh, shoulders and chest. So, um, and <laughs> too much information. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, so, uh, but that's. That's a you know problem I share with some of my coworkers here at Castle Keepers who go who are out cleaning and so we always have to go back to how it how it's fitted sure. on you while you're cleaning. But but truly, almost without exception, if anybody is having any type of problems with it not being comfortable or weighing too much or back hurting, it's a training issue and it, it just hasn't they're not wearing it properly. And, and again, there'll be a, a video here that you'll be getting after this webinar that uh, I would encourage you to look at and to uh, have your cleaning technicians uh, study that uh, it's important for a lot of reasons to make sure that uh, they know how to use this equipment properly and, and they're wearing it properly. Okay, that was a... Ruth says thank you very much for that one. She's uh, excited to get your feedback there. You're welcome. Um, we have a question from Tracy about uh, attachments. Um, does the backpack come with attachments for couches, chairs, upholstery, and, or, or uh, other areas, in addition to the, the power head that uh, was demonstrated? Yes, uh, um, it also comes with an upholstery brush, a crevice tool, a little round brush, which, um, God, I can't remember the name of that one. And we throw in a, a floor tool which has a brush around it um, because we don't use the power nozzle on wood floors. The literature suggests and the training video suggests you can. You just turn off the brush roller, but we don't. We take the whole nozzle, um, power nozzle off, and we just use a floor tool on a hard surface floors. And again, that's a judgment call as to yeah. how much hard floor you're doing, but right. just as a little value-added thing that we do here at Modern Cleaning, we like to uh, give people who, who buy their equipment from us that option. And um, you can wear them either around your waist, you can slip them right into the little loops they have, elastic loops they have around your waist, or we um, in Castle Keepers stick them in our um, aprons too. So we carry them around with the, in our aprons. Yes. Okay. I'm um, going to go back to uh, talking about changing bags in between uh, jobs or, or daily. Um, the question, is there a six-quart and a ten-quart option for the bags? And if you were using the ten-quart, would, you know, would you need to change it between each job? Uh, the reason for changing it between each job is a sanitary reason. We don't. It it does contain. It does keep the soil in the vacuum very well. It doesn't um, come out the back like uh, the research shows. It does in a lot of different types of vacuums. It's a lot less in a a sealed unit like the protein. But we do do that because that's what our clients request yeah. and that's each vacuum only has one size bag and right the, and the dust bag in the sierra is a is a little bit smaller than the dust bag in either the uh, canister or the upright that that we looked at that being said it's uh plenty uh, big enough to contain soil from from you know more than one home so if you're changing it between homes that really isn't an issue and as Janice said that the, the bigger issue is you get better uh, better performance and you're picking up more soil more quickly and containing it more if you're you're changing the bag. That's great. Uh, that looks like the end of our questions that have have come through, and we are pretty close to the end of our time, uh, which means I think it's time to find out who won the pro team. So you're going to see a little bit of a screen change I'm here. Go, I'm going to pass the ball back to you, okay? Yep. All right. Yeah, give, give me a drum roll. We don't have any instruments here. <laughs> the winner is 
Serena Nelson, Zephyr Cleaning Yay. Services of Hayden, Idaho. So congratulations, Karina. We will be getting in touch with you to find out where to uh, ship your brand new free Pro Team Sierra backpack. And uh, we'll take this time as we're uh, we're closing up to remind you there are a couple. Uh, ISE hosts a number of educational opportunities throughout the month. We have one tomorrow. Derek Christian is talking about market strategy and planning. He is offering a new program starting in December. So if you want to learn more about that, uh, you can uh, register for that webinar. It's tomorrow afternoon, Friday at uh, 3.30 p.m. Eastern. I think that's right. 3 or 3.30. It'll say on there. 3 o'clock. I have a slide on that, Cece. If you don't, right. I can help you with that. Okay. And uh, the next one coming up, uh, Derek will be talking again in a few weeks in early December. I think it's December 5th at uh, 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern. He is talking about gathering competitive intelligence, how to go out and find out what your competitors are doing and what they might be planning to do coming up you know, for different, uh, different holidays or events uh, so that you can put together a strategy. Uh, both uh, wonderful programs, and we're excited to have Derek doing those for us. So that's tomorrow, market strategy and planning, and then again December 5th, it's a Wednesday, on um, gathering competitive intelligence. Tom, Janice, I'll throw it back to you. Any final, final notes or comments? Well, thank you for um, taking an hour out of your day and spending it with us. We appreciate it. Please, uh, please give us a call if you have any questions. Um, if if we can help you uh, incorporate uh, some of this equipment in your business, we're we're certainly here to do that. Um, Pro Team has a really um, really aggressive uh, discount program for RXE members that uh, is you know running through the balance of this year, and I would uh, encourage anybody who thinks that a vac backpack vacuum would uh, fit well into their cleaning methodology to take advantage of this opportunity. Just give us a call, and we can we can help you out with that. Fantastic. Well, thank you all for joining us, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.